Welcome, Council and staff and ladies and gentlemen are joining us and also our guests who will be identified in a few minutes from now. At this time, I'll go to the clerk to identify any items to add or delete. Uh, there are no items to add or delete uh, this afternoon, Your Worship. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councilor Sainsbury, second by Councilor Noya, that the agenda for the Committee of a Whole Working Meeting held on July 25th, 2022, be confirmed or circulated. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. If anyone has a peculiar interest in payment now or when the item comes up? Thank you. The next one is uh, WS1, and I'll go to the our CIO to make the introduction. Mr. CIO. Thank you, Mayor Milne, and good afternoon, uh, Mayor Milne, Deputy Mayor Norcross, and members of council. Um, always fun to gather in, in working sessions, especially for things where we're um, you know, working collaboratively, not only between uh, our our employees and, and our council, but also reaching out into the community, and, and in this case, the business community. Um, if council recalls a, a few years ago, uh, we were involved in putting together um, an economic development strategy for our community to, to help build our local economy. Uh, that was, I believe, in 2018. A couple of years later, we ran into a few bumps along the way, and the last two and a half years have been less than ideal for our uh, our local economy and the international economy as well. So, um, if you recall back in the uh, when we uh, discussed the budget um, and our business plan this year with members of council, we thought it was prudent to um, not only uh, redo or redevelop an economic development strategy, but have maybe a shorter term, more intense type of, of look at things and try to build some resiliency and help our local economy recover. So um, what we've done is in keeping with that direction from council and under the direction of, and I will introduce you the, to those of you that haven't met her, Becky Breeden is our new economic development uh, coordinator. So she has been spearheading this project literally, I think since the day after you started. Um, and Becky's only been with us for about six weeks, but uh, we're thrilled to have her come on board. She spent a number of years with the County of Simcoe, so she's very familiar with the area and uh, a number of our opportunities and challenges as well. So uh, she's spearheading this project. So Mayor Milne, if it's good with you, I'll turn things over to Becky and she'll do a more detailed inter, uh, introduction to our guests this afternoon and, uh, and the fun that lies ahead for the next couple of hours. Thank you very much, Mr. Seho. At this time, I'm very happy to, to hand it back over to Becky. Becky? We're on now. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to introduce Nancy Johnson, the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Dorothy St. John's uh, COVID Economic Recovery Industry Expert from McSweeney & Associates. Uh, McSweeney & Associates has been retained uh, to help us develop this new economic development strategy. As noted in the staff report, uh, McSweeney and Associates actually developed our last strategy that has just actually completed this year. So they have a wealth of knowledge about the actual community and they've actually worked with a number of our partner municipalities in the region. So they have a great understanding of the economy here locally. So the purpose of today's uh, working session is to help develop the priorities and the action items that will actually come out of the strategy. So the documents that you guys have been provided ahead of time was the uh, workbook, which kind of summarized all of the trends and the topics that we learned through interviews, through tours of the town, a uh, situational analysis, and also one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. Following that, they basically summarized everything into this workbook and what they're going to ask you guys to do now after a short presentation about what they learned and then also a short presentation about what is successful economic development. They're going to ask you guys to work in a group and basically help us figure out what those priorities and action items should be. Tomorrow, we'll be actually working with a great group of uh, stakeholders in the community, 25 individuals, to actually go through this same process again. And they'll be actually helping us develop more uh, initiatives and strategies based on the information gained. We will take that and compile, compile a uh, work plan and an action item that we will bring back to you for approval in September. 
So uh, with permission of your worship, I'd like to turn things over to Nancy uh, with McSweeney and Associates. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. We had a great tour of your community this morning. Uh, Becky took us all over, so it was fantastic. So uh, we have a good, a good feel for your community in a short period of time. Uh, so um, I'm Nancy Johnson. I'm, I'm as Becky said, I'm uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives. I've been involved with uh, McSweeney and Associates for about five years now. Um, I've worked on a number of communities uh, across Ontario and Alberta. So uh, like I said, I'm really happy to be here and to be doing the working session today with you. Um, my colleague, Dorothy. Uh, I'm Dorothy St. George. Um, it's nice to meet you, Mayor Mill, members of council. Uh, I joined McSweeney uh, earlier this year, um, having spent 25 years in economic development, both at the city of Hamilton and more recently 15 years with the town of Oakville. I was the director of economic development there and was also involved in the last two years in corporate strategy for council, uh, diversity inclusion and climate action. So I'm pleased to be here and joining McSweeney on this project. Thank you both. Um, as Becky said, I'm gonna do, we're gonna do a quick presentation to start off with, uh, just to give you sort of a little bit of background on uh, economic development and what we've heard from the community. Um, we are, uh, we're going to be very quick because the, the most important part is the input that we're getting from you. So this is the agenda. We're here to, when, why are we here today? Uh, where are we in the process? We're going to do a little bit of uh, the formula for economic development success. We're going to look at the score, which is the strengths, challenges, opportunities, aspirations, results. And then uh, that's a presentation. Then we're going to talk about the strategic themes, and this is where you participate is is helping us with this, helping us with the strategic actions. And then we'll do a quick wrap up. Wrap up. So the main objective is really uh, to sort of formulate uh, a set of actions. Uh, they may not come out exactly at the end of the day, exactly like we they've been discussed here, but we'll take them back and sort of massage them and, and come up with uh, true actions. But this is really the basis of the strategy that we are uh, working with you on. So really, why is it, what, why a strate strategic plan? Why is it important? It's about building a strong foundation. It's really allowing the town to be strategic with its resources and it creates positive change. Where are we in the process? So. We have actually been doing quite a, a bit of a, a background. We have developed a um, situational analysis, which I'm not sure if everybody had a chance to see, but it's quite substantial. Uh, it gives you a lot of background information on economic base of New Tecumseh, uh, population stats, those sorts of things. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, please take some time to look at because it's got some great detail in it. We also did a document re review We've, um, we're now in the consultation stage where we're doing surveys and interviews. We put the summary of the situation together, which is the workbook. And now we're in the working session. And as Be Becky said, today we're here, tomorrow we're doing uh, a working session with the public. So looking forward to that. And uh, then I will at the end talk about sort of where we're, well, I guess the next thing we're doing is an action planning session, which takes all of this, all of the, um, uh, actions that have been developed and we are going to work with staff and whoever else uh, staff is interested in having participate to come up with the actual uh, actions that uh, are doable and realistic because that's really important. The next uh, phase three is about the strategy and drafting the strategy, uh, having consultation on the strategy with staff and then creating the final strategy and our plan is to be presenting this to council on September 12th. So this is quite a quite um, a quick um, process, which is fantastic. And uh, it's good to get all this done very quickly and into your hands on September 12th. Uh, the last thing we do is an implementation plan, which is involves taking each of the actions and actually it's more of a work plan, but uh, developing sort of uh, finance, like the finances for each of the actions and who's responsible, but we'll go through that later. 
So a little bit about uh, our formula for economic development success. This is meaning McSweeney and Associates. So we have a bit of a, we have a longer presentation that we do, um, but this is sort of a, a synopsis of this, of economic development and why it's important. So just uh, what is economic development? And everybody has a different idea of what economic development is. It's in the past been sort of chasing smokestacks, finding that one great business that's going to be here forever. You have Honda, so that's fantastic. But it also involves a lot of other things. It could be, you know, marketing. It could be it's working with small businesses. It's business attraction. So there's a lot involved with economic development. So be kind on Becky. Um, so really the main goal for um, for the strategy is and and for anything is is you want an economically sustainable community. You want a community where your where your residents are happy to be here, happy to live here. They um, have all the amenities that they need. They also have jobs. they have uh, they're able to hopefully live and work in their own community and support their own community. And really economic development too is a long-term, it's a long-term process. So it's not something that you start today and finish tomorrow. It's long-term. You, like we said, talk about building your foundation and working through and getting, you know, getting that foundation and building on that. And each year it's, you're building on that foundation. So it is long-term. Don't think of things that are gonna happen in the next day or the next year. This one is just, a pretty basic sort of uh, image of the rain barrel. And it talks about your local economy and the money that's coming into your economy through manufacturing, agriculture, tourism, things that are from outside of your community coming in, mixing that and keeping that money in the water bear in the rain barrel and having the least amount of leakage leakage out of your area as possible. And that's going to create a more sustainable and, and a greater econo economy for your community. So, you know, if residents are leaving to shop in other areas, then that's money out of the local economy. If they're going away on vacation, out of the lo local economy. But when you're bringing those people into the economy, they're bringing money in into your community. So it's fairly simple, but I, it's been the most effective uh, image that we have. The main drivers around economic development are people in place. So you need the people to support the community, to, to, you need people to staff the businesses, and you need a place to put people, either resi resident, residences, homes, but you also need a place to put businesses. You need land, you need buildings. If a business comes to your community and wants to set up, you need a place to put them. A bit of the outdated sort of approach is at one time was about bringing that industry in. And then the industry brings the people in. And then you, when you have that group of people that, that your, your population, then it, then the quality of life, it sort of improves in the area. Today, it's a bit different. People are looking for places to live and to work. They're looking for a, a great place to be. They're looking for that quality of place. They want to be able to they have a job, uh, they want to have a great place, a home to live in, they want to have all those amenities that come with um, a good quality of life, great shopping, great, uh, you know, recreation, all those sorts of things. So once you've created that quality of place, then the people are coming. And then out of that, the businesses, you're, you're able to create or um, attract more businesses or work with the businesses that are here. So it's a bit different. So quality of place is important at the beginning. So really when we're looking at the formula for economic success, it's about people and process and that makes the, that sort of the power of economic development. So the people, um, so be part of the formula is really important. Everybody in the community is all part of this. Economic development is a community based uh, program that it's, it's not just one person or another, it's everybody. It's like the community supporting the biz, local businesses and helping bring in new businesses. So really it starts with you and you meaning the community and talking about you, know, you as the having an 
a positive attitude, being optimistic, coming up with those bold ideas. So hopefully we come up with some bold ideas today and just the belief in the ability to sort of affect change in your community. When we look at uh, the process wheel, and the, as I said, economic development is really a long-term process. It's really never finished. Um, so it's really preparing. So we, we talk about preparing, strategizing, and economic doing. So the preparing part is having all of those base, that base information about your community. This is a good start to have all this information available um, in the situational analysis. That's a lot of the data that uh, uh, on your community. But it's also things like having an updated website, um, a property inventory, having something, an economic profile, a community profile, so that you have all that information available so that when somebody does come in looking for a piece of property that you have that available for them. Strategizing is about the economic development strategy, creating strategies that will help you to get to, to build your economy. And then the economic doing is actually the implementation. So doing um, business visitation, for instance, or for um, working with entrepreneurs and uh, investment, potentially like investment and traction. So it's so, but they all are interconnected, as you can see in the in this process wheel that, you know, sometimes you have to jump ahead and do the business visitation because you have to go out and find out what the businesses are interested in, where they are, are they growing, are they leaving, are they, what are they doing before you do some of the other things. So it's, 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 it's a bit complex, uh, a lot of things going on at the same time, but really it's, you need that, you need to start off with that foundation and the preparing part. So really, as we said, the formula for economic development success is about people and about the process and those both those two together. So the score, as I said, is the strengths, challenges, opportunities, and aspirations and results. And we uh, did have a number of consultations. We, did, we received 49 uh, online survey responses. We did one-on-one -on -one in phone interviews with 11 people. We reviewed 50 documents and um, also with the, with the uh, situational analysis looked at that. So based on that information that we collected from the community and from um, council and staff, uh, we came up with the strengths. And these are the major strengths. Now it's in the uh, workbook, it's a lot more detailed, but um, it, the sort of main strengths around the New Tecumseh, and I'm sure you are quite aware of these, is a close proximity to the GTA and a large market, uh, access to the transportation, both road and rail. And you do have a strong uh, industrial base already, which is great. Um, also, it seems like your business ecosystem is very supportive of and has good partners. And I think the main thing out of this is a population growth rate. We're seeing 24.3% over the next 10 years which is quite substantial. So um, that's, that's very positive and your good quality of life. The challenges that were sort of revealed through this, this background information we collected was uh, there is retail leakage to other communities. Um, I think you're all aware too, the infrastructure to support industry is uh, limited. Uh, there was also this impression that the town is not really business friendly. So um, that's that came out a bit as well. A labor shortages was a huge one. Um, and uh, um, then the other is about the challenges sort of between and the tension between new residents and longtime residents. And that's going to continue because you've got such growth rate going on. The entrenched values that are slow to change and then the three unique and different urban centers that work independently. And we kind of see that because they are, everyone is so spread out. And then of course, some of the infrastructure that is uh, lacking or limited is internet, public transit, housing and the diverse housing. And then daycare was another one that uh, came out of the background uh, information that we collected. So some of the aspirations. So we asked people, you know, what do you, what do you, how do you see the the community in the next five, 10 years? Um, we got some things back around the electric car industry and one was told, you know, we, this would be a great place to, 
be the place for Ontario to uh, for the electric car industry. So something to think about. Um, more obviously more diversified uh, economy, um, more micro and home based businesses, tourism as an emerging uh, sector, um, downtown businesses using more technology. I mean, sustaining that agricultural base, uh, focus on future tech, and then uh, ca businesses catering to seniors. So these are just a few of the things that were pulled out. Again, that um, somehow uh, showcasing the three distinct cores as one town and uh, that well-planned community. And then really looking at the future and saying, okay, so when in 10 years, what is new Tecumseh is going to be like? It's going to be one cohesive entity. It's going to be a connected community and ready for investment. You're going to really understand that business community over the next five to ten years. You're going to have a real. You're going to have a much more diverse economy. You're going to have three economically vibrant commercial districts, and you're also going to have a, a variety of local activities, events that are support supporting that visiting friends and relatives tourist sector, and then you will continue to have that mix of urban and rural. So you're not going to be, the, that rural is really important as, as well as the urban and maintaining the small town character, which is which really was strong with all of the discussion that I that we had. So I guess my first question is, have we captured the main issues? Is there anything that we're missing? Is there anything that you think that is not in there? I'm going to go back two slides. Uh, we found a common element that the town's considered not business friendly. Could you maybe elaborate on where that came from and do you have any examples? Um, it, I think it was mostly more around process and the, I, I can't remember, I don't know who exactly it came from, but it, uh, but, and it's not important, but it was just the fact that it was maybe a slower process. It wasn't that um, it was it was a bit of a slower process and that maybe they needed more um, background information on it but as you went through the process. So instead of at the beginning, you know, when you come in to, to, um, to, to do a permit or any, any sort of process that you um, need to have, that they need to be sort of, they need to know the process before they get there. So, or when they get there, so that they're not thinking, oh, well, I think it's going to be done in three months and now it's taking eight months. So no. just educating them at the beginning. Okay, good no, because I think we should, sorry, worship to you. I, I think we need to really investigate that because it's a very bold statement that's gone into a public document that will be circulated to business people in the community who mm -hmm. may be looking to make an investment here. So if there's a concept of perception out there that we're not business friendly, then the onus is on us to say, how do we change that? Yes. And, and that's a challenge. How do, we, how do we make that better? Right. And that's a good thing because the challenges aren't always necessarily bad because they do show you that there's there's an opportunity there. So you're right. So it's an opportunity for sure to uh, to become more business friendly. And then that's and that'll be part of our discussion today too. How do you do that? And you. you you will probably hear that in any community you go to, red tape, red tape, government. I can never get my permit fast enough. So it's it's not uncommon to hear that when you're doing consultation in the community. No, thank you. I just and, want yeah. to make it better. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. Councillor Sainsbury. Uh, thank you, Worship. Tomorrow uh, you're having your public day. And I think by invitation, the 25 some odd. Yeah, and is it held here? And is it taped so we could know what was done and said? Or at least on the computer? Or is there some way that you could have a record? It's not taped, but we'll be taking extensive notes yeah. and you will have information based on all of that content. Okay, and something, and a second question, Your Worship. Um, because of Honda, you mentioned them several times uh, with the electric car and so on. Is Honda doing the charging stations too, or is that a whole other industry we could lure here because Honda's here? <laughs> to my knowledge, Honda isn't doing that, but um, there is a group that you might be aware of, and it's called the Ontario Auto Mayors, and it's communities across Ontario who have um, an original equipment manufacturer or a large supplier in the auto industry, and um, these communities get together and they talk about what, what 
communities can do to help advance the, the adoption of electric vehicles. So what kind of infrastructure can you put in place? Are municipalities, for example, putting in uh, charging stations that are consistent across Ontario? So they know that they need to talk about that. They need to talk to industry so that there is a coordinated approach. The reason I ask is because we have Honda, but we have Oticur and we have uh, FNP. We have all the other subsidiaries that make parts, SP, Simco Parts, SPS, I think it's called. And, um, and so maybe, as you say, if they're looking across Ontario, then they could look to those uh, things and they could see if there's space because I know they gave up some space and crossed the road at Honda. And there may be space in that big building on the south side of industrial. It's, a, it's absolutely if they do an, op conversion. an opportunity to look at the whole supply chain for electric vehicles, you know, right down to the batteries that go into it or the charging stations that you need in the community. We, we are part of that uh, that group, uh, as you know, 1. 6, or 1. Yeah, $1.6 billion was given to Honda for the electric cars. Uh, so, yes, uh, New Dehumps is part of that group. Thank you. Councillor Jeb. Thank you, Worship. Through you to either one. Um, when you talk about agriculture, do you have anyone from the agriculture community participating? Uh, one time we did have FS grains uh, that were participating in some workshops, and I'm not sure if they're still participating, but I'd like to know if anybody from the agricultural community is participating in these. Nancy or Dorothy? I did the mailing list. So yes, so we have the Federation of Agriculture will be attending the Ontario Federation of Agriculture's local representative and FFS, FFS partners will be attending. Just sure. that agriculture is the second largest industry in our community. So it, I think it's very important that they be included in this. So. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, uh, Dorothy or Nancy, go ahead. So out of all this background information that we've collected, we came up with four proposed strategic themes. And these are very, fairly general, but really also very specific to this area. Uh, we taught, we're we talking about the first one being healthy commercial districts, uh, investment readiness, business retention expansion, and also economic diversification. So just to sort of go over a little bit about what healthy commercial districts are, and we know you've got three, three commercial districts in New Texas. They're all in varying sort of states of growth and uh, business mix. And this is, and we know that downtown commercial districts are very important to the community. Um, so it's, uh, so how, so it's looking at the downtowns and how to create that sort of critical mass of activities um, where people can come to the community and celebrate, live, work, play, and shop and support the business. The second one is about investment readiness. Now, this is uh, going back to the the, the beginning and um, about the on the the wheel, the preparing wheel. And so, what do you need to be investment ready? So, investment readiness is about being prepared when businesses come to your community and they want to set up. Are you prepared for them? Uh, do you have uh, land available for them? Do you have buildings for them to come into? Is the process that's set up uh, through the through planning or through uh, is that uh, easy for them to navigate? Um, are you business friendly? Uh, it's also about having that inventory of places to do business, um, having that community profile, just having all that information on your community available and ready. The next one is about business retention and expansion. And this is really about the businesses that are located in your business community right now. So basically looking at sort of the majority of investment and business development opportunities, about 70 to 80% of those is a generally accepted percentage that actually um, new business comes from existing business. So it may be a business that's here that wants to expand. It wants to maybe they know of another business that's interested in coming in. Maybe they're a business that um, 
has already is in the community and um, they've heard of another business that's, that's coming in. So that goes back to that business, uh, business visitation and meeting up with the businesses and finding out where they are and working with them to see what the, what they need. And the last thing you want to do is to be surprised that a business is leaving town. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to know what, what the business community is doing, how they're feeling, challenges they're facing so that you can react to them in advance. Um, there's good news you can hear about new businesses that's com that are coming in or expansion that's taking place as Nancy mentioned, but you also wanna hear where there are potential issues. And that's a, an important thing to address early on. And, and it can be done. Yeah. And also you want to make sure you want to know if they're thinking of moving out of town. Like, oh, they haven't been able to find a place within town. So they've decided they're moving to Barrie or something. So you want to know that ahead of time so that before they leave. <laughs> COVID presented um, an interesting problem for a number of businesses as well, because some of them had to close quickly and reopen. They had challenges with with uh, getting their labor force to and from. They changed their hours of operation or maybe put in or reduced a shift. So understanding those challenges and, and looking at ways in which the community or the town can help assist and support them is very important. If I could just uh, Councilor Harrison McIntyre. Thank you. Who who's who keeps track of that information? Who's responsible for keeping in touch with the businesses and knowing where they're at? That's economic development. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you kindly, Mayor Milne. Through you to um, Nancy or Dorothy. Does the current job description of, of I mean, she seems, uh, only just matter for this here tonight, but she certainly seems outgoing. Does her job description reflect exactly what you're saying here? Because I think what I think that's something for us to take away is that I think your points are incredibly well well said, and I would think that her that Becky's job would be out there gathering this information, and being constantly aware of it. So as businesses come to the community, so I just want to know if I guess we'll look at that in internally. I think based on my based on our meeting with uh, Becky this morning, she's like she's been doing a lot of things that we would recommend to do. I think. So we would we would take a look at that job description. Mm -hmm. the, the, one of the issues with economic development is there's so many different things to be doing when you're looking at attraction, retention, expansion, marketing, all sorts of uh, there's all sorts of different roles an economic developer can play. But the important thing is looking at that strategy and where that individual should be spending their time, and that's that's the real challenge. I'll go with CAO. Thank you, Mirmel. Just um, further to uh, to the comments of uh, of our consultants, um, I think that's something, Councillor Foster, that I, I will look into uh, once we get some uh, a little bit more defined strategy. Because I think um, some of the comments are just you know economic development. When you have one person, one pair of hands, can be a bit of a shotgun. You know, you're doing a little bit of retention, a little bit of expansion you're you know trying to keep your your um you know your hand on the pulse of the the economic community i'd like to see it a little bit more a laser focused than you know sort of splattered um so i think once we can sort of define what the next few years will, will look like in the strategy then we can start to define um becky's focus a little bit more supplementary okay i was just going to say sorry I just, can I just respond to what Lane was saying? Of course you can. Is that um, at the end of the process, at the once the strategy is done and the actions are completed, we create an implementation plan. So within that implementation plan, we take each action and it also and timelines so that that gives you it. It goes back to that being more strategic, so that um, Becky's going to know what she needs to do in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. And all of you will, and so um, and also the budget that's around that. So it will be more strategic, and so hopefully, Becky's not going to be running all over doing a bunch of things. That this is what she she's got these projects that have to be done. Good, thank you, Councillor Sainsbury. Ah, uh, thank you, Worship. The um, retention 
of the businesses we have. Is there not, and perhaps you already do it, or the former economic development officer may have done it, but <clears throat> is there not a form we could send annually to the appropriate contact person for each company in town to say what are their future plans for the next five years or 10 years or whatever years? And if they're thinking of addition, they have to go up because they don't have the land to go laterally and that kind of thing. And that way they get into the process through the buildings uh, department and that sort of thing. So right now, unfortunately, there isn't a form that we have. Um, other communities do do similar things. Unfortunately, their rates of receipt are very low from the businesses. Businesses yeah. don't fill out the survey. So um, from personal experience, I was involved, and Councillor Jeb, because I did harass her on it, was involved with a BRE study we did, a business retention expansion study for agriculture. And I had to physically go to people's houses to do the survey to get them to fill it in. So, so like, for example, in this area, um, Councillor Beatty's father participated, other people, we had to physically participate. But that's a good form and a good response for what the deputy mayor is concerned about, that we're not doing business well. Well, yeah. if they're not sending anything back and they're responsible for their company, then I don't think they're working as hard as they could for the future of their company. So maybe the company needs to know that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> having said that, my next question is the supply chain. Um, <laughs> and it, with monopolies like for instance canadian tires huge and and walmart and so on and the mom and pop operations they all sell those things too and in order to retain them they have to have some stock on the shelves and they kind of because of covid and because of supply chain and so on uh, they're saying half the shelves are empty they're saying well it didn't come in or we can't get it anymore or they're, they're not paying any attention because we only want two cartons of it or whatever H how do we get that back on track on how the people they used to do business with kind of not interested anymore in smaller scale if we're going to retain the small businesses. Dorothy or Nancy? <laughs> well, maybe both of us. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think that um, when you're dealing with these small independent businesses, it is a challenge for them, um, uh, particularly with supply chain. If they're not a big customer, it's harder to, harder to get that inventory in. Sometimes you just have to work with what you've got. Um, there are communities that um, but do help support those businesses by really doing marketing programs around shop local. And when a community comes together to, to focus on shopping local, it's those small independent businesses that really do benefit. So it's, it's not just a town effort, it really is a community effort. And the Chambers of Commerce can be involved, the BIAs in really marshalling marshalling that message that it's important to keep these businesses here or they will disappear. Okay, thank you. Councillor Beatty. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, in New Tecumseh, we have two business improvement associations as well as two chambers of commerce. Um, for a town of roughly 40,000 people with our growth trajectory, um, being one town, how do you bring those four different teams together to get in one lane with one vision? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of what we did in Oakville. We had three business improvement areas, one chamber of commerce, a, a pretty strong chamber. Um, but the three BIAs were always operating quite independently, and it was a big challenge. Um, the way that we, we did bring them together um, was to start a committee. And it, and it was led by economic development. Um, they met once a month. Um, COVID, it was a little more often. And it was the executive directors from the BIAs and the chamber. And they started looking at coordinating events. Uh, the shop local program was coordinated through that. Um, digital Main Street. So economic development and the town was able to get funding for each of the BIAs by submitting and managing one application from the town. And uh, when I spoke with the Digital Main Street team in Toronto, they said, we'd much rather deal with the town. Um, you can coordinate it with your BIAs. And that really became the catalyst for that group coming together. Then they started looking at doing joint events instead of separate events all over the place that was, and they were cannibalizing, you know, the, the people who would come to these. Um, they started doing, say, a taste of Oakville, where you went to each of those areas, but all three BIAs and the town and the chamber marketed it jointly. 
So I think a, a, a committee, an informal committee um, is best. And you just start with a nugget and it builds and the success begets success. Thanks, Your Worship. And uh, supplementary through to Blaine. Blaine, do you see merit in the ED coordinator having uh, per forming perhaps as a subgroup or a working committee that would work alongside uh, yourself as, as and advise you and council and sort of shepherd the chambers and BIAs along one vision? It almost feels like if we don't and everybody works in silos, everybody does what they're what they're set out to do, but at the town, there's no cohesiveness, there's no bringing all these events together. And I think that's the piece that's missing in a growing municipality that has three distinct communities and three distinct identities. Mr. CEO. Thank you, Mr. Milne. Um, and, and that's an interesting question, Councillor Beatty, and one that we could probably spend most of the afternoon discussing just on its own. Um, I think uh, a, a common vision always is, is a best starting point um you know we this council as well as the previous council has spoken at, at great length sometimes about um you know the concept of one town the, the vision of one town um I'll, I'll be i'll be frank with with council um it starts with attitude quite frankly um if you have collective vision and you have an attitude to work collaboratively to realize that vision then i think you'll realize a lot more than what you would if you're working in um you know, pulling in different directions. Quite frankly, we can't have the businesses of Alliston thinking that the businesses of Tottenham are competition. It's one town. What is good for businesses in part of the town is good for business in all of the town. It's good for the residents. It's good for the community. Yeah. You know, if we have a business come to the industrial area of Alliston, that should be good for everyone. Because if you stress what Dorothy and Nancy are talking about with respect to um, shopping locally. Well, if you're living in Alliston or Beaton and you're working in Alliston, then why wouldn't you want to go and visit a bistro or a boutique shop in Tottenham? That would be good for the entire town. So I think a collective vision would be uh, beneficial. Um, I think the attitude of all of those involved um, has to be um, to work together. Um, but yes, I think something like that, that joint committee, uh, that's been mentioned, I think, is something that we would certainly want to explore. Yes. Good question. Councillor uh, Jab and then Councillor McIntyre. Thank you. Following up with uh, Councillor B, I think that's a great idea that, you know, we're one town and, and making setting up a committee to to work the BIAs together and just touching base on the agriculture. We're in full fledged wheat harvest right now. So if Becky wants to ride in a combine <laughs> and get firsthand of how the grain is shipped down to the grain bins, be more than able to hook you up with combine. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor, through to Councillor Jeb. I grew up on a farm, so I'm all good. Thank you. <laughs> but just saying, if you need need to reach out to any of their local farmers, I'm sure that we'll be able to get in touch with, get you in touch. Being, I think, boots on the ground and seeing firsthand what, and uh, pulling some of the, the the directors out with you maybe might be an experience too for them. <laughs> Councillor McClellan, then Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. I'm not sure who exactly this question is for, but. I'm not sure how our procurement bylaw can play into this because I notice a lot when when the town is needing um, catering, for instance, it always seems to come from out of town because usually I think what we do is pick the the cheapest bidder. So I don't know if our procurement bylaw can be um, added to or written in such that you know people get extra points for for being local. I'm not sure if that, but I know. In the past, we definitely seem to go out of town for um, catering and whatnot. So I'm not sure if that can play a role in this at all. Good question, CAO. Thank you, Mayor Milne, and through uh, to Councillor McClellan. Um, there's always, a, um, I guess, a lot of discussion around trying to support local business. Um, going down the route of the procurement bylaw is, is a little bit, I, I would caution council on that because we're obviously always trying to ensure that the taxpayer's dollar is used in the most wise and valuable way. Um, that could be to support our local business in an indirect way, 
directly, however, it might not be. So generally, I would always uh, caution council on, on altering our procurement process to favor local business. I think there are many other ways that we can support um, our local business, uh, but we can certainly look at the procurement bylaw, but I would suggest some caution in that area. Uh, and just for your interest, Councillor McClellan, um, throughout the last couple of years, we've tried to do the exact opposite and only use local businesses to try to support them throughout the entire pandemic. Um, everything that we've reached out to, whether it be a staff recognition event, the mayor's breakfast, the, the everything was done locally. Um, trying to think of a few others, but I know all of our, um, our staff recognition stuff locally, we've tried to, um, you know, support, you know, in, in place of um, our, what we classified as our, as our TNT social committee, uh, obviously had to go online and virtual over the last couple of years. So we tried to do various activities. All of our staff recognition was all certificates to local restaurants and local businesses that were helping out. Uh, and they were obviously extremely uh, welcome to that because we tried to reach out to uh, restaurants and, and businesses in all three communities to uh, to try to support them over the last um, couple of years, especially. But we certainly, when we have the flexibility to do that, we try and do that. Supplementary. And I think that great that's great. And I think it speaks very, um, very loudly when the town uses um, local businesses. Um, I just think when we're talking about people maybe being hesitant doing business with the town, I, I think that may be a reason is obviously not in the last couple of years because those have been quite strange years. But, you know, when when local vendors get passed over for somebody in Barrie or Wasega or Vaughan, um, it, it really puts them off. And I think it does send a very strong message when the town uses uh, local vendors for whatever they need vendors for. So something to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. I just want to touch on what Councillor Sainsbury said there about the businesses and them not uh, filling out the forms and not doing their end. I, I think what that says to me is that we need to do a better job on our end because maybe they're not filling out the forms because they don't think we're listening. And maybe they're not taking the time to fill out those forms because they think we don't care. So I, I once again, I'm going to say the onus is on this council and Ms. Pounty to show our local businesses how much we do care and do a better job to make sure they want to participate. I'm going to blame for this then, Dorothy. Thank you, Mayor Milne. And to, to, to your point, Deputy Mayor Norcross, I completely agree. I think that there's, you know, when someone, um, you know, believes that the town is is not business friendly, um, that, that could be just because we haven't done a good enough job communicating as to what's involved. You know, as members of council realize, some of our processes are complex. They're that way for a reason. They don't, some don't necessarily need to be complex and where there don't have to be, then we try to make them as, as clean and simple as possible. But in some cases, when someone comes in for a permit, to your point, Deputy Mayor, they're, they're not planners, they're not engineers, they're business people. They know how to run their business. And, um, you know, for an example, for our, our temporary patio program over the last couple of years, um, our, our discussion internally was these, these folks are not draftsmen, they're not engineers, they're not like if something, in all honesty, what I, I told our folks is if a sketch comes in on the back of a napkin, if you can read it and there's dimensions on it, then let's get it through. You know, let's try and, you know, work with these people. These guys are just trying to keep their head above water. I, I don't really care whether it's dimensioned and to scale and just give us something that we can interpret and work with these guys. And I know our engineering department under Mr. Vatry's direction, went out and tried to work with our local businesses. I saw those guys out in parking lots trying to help wherever they wherever they could. But to your point, Deputy Mayor Norcross, I think that's part of it. I think we need to do a better job of, and some of that is, again, because they're going to look at that and go, you want me to fill out a 21-page survey? Really, in my spare time, I'm trying to run a business here. So if we can simplify what we're asking and tell them how we're going to use that information, and then go back to them afterwards and tell them how we did, and they can actually see the results of how we did, then I think that starts to build some trust and confidence in, in those folks that, yes, we are listening. We're asking the most appropriate questions. We're not asking, you know, 157 questions. We're asking the biggest three, and then we take that information and we use it. Oh, yes, I completely agree. Good. I'll go back to Dorothy. 
Well, just to follow on that, it does come down to communication. And as members of council, you're doing it and dealing with your constituents all the time. Um, economic development has that soft role as well in, in the soft skill of talking to businesses, not necessarily when they have a challenge or when they need something, but just to understand. And the best term I heard from a business um, years ago was, show me the love. Show me that you care about us. Jerry McGuire. And, <laughs> and it's, it's not just the new businesses that are coming to town. I think it's the ones who've been here for 50 years that resent in a way that no one's paying any attention to them. And it, it's when the new ones come to town and you make a big fanfare and there's photo ops and, and it's great to see the new businesses coming in. But showing some of the other companies the love just by getting out and talking to them, um, then they're going to come reach back in. They're going to fill out that form when you want them to, or they're going to come and talk to you when they need to do their expansion. So that communication just can't be, the value of that can't be under, underestimated. I think that's sort of the bottom line around economic development. It is relationship building. It's building that relationship with the businesses on a, you know, whatever however many times you go out and see them or connect with them and it's like Dorothy said it's not when there's a challenge when they have an issue because or they're upset about something but it's like getting out there and having a discussion with them when they have time because we know they're really busy too but when they have time building that relationship yeah uh Custer Foster thank you Mayor Milne I think you just nailed it if if, if, if Becky was to take some time walk up and down the streets of Beaton, Tottenham, and Alliston, walk in with a business card, introduce yourself as your economic development officer, you would see people's heads snap around and say, who are you? What? This is fantastic. So to your point about communication, she's proven she's got a great sense of humor. That's always an icebreaker for anybody. So at the end of the day, I think with a few small steps, she, she could endear herself to an awful lot of people, which I think would be a huge step to uh, seeing her success here in New Tecumseh. I'm glad you brought that up, Councillor Foster. We've just finished Alliston, and next week we're going to Beaton and then Tottenham, doing exactly what you said. Uh, just to get back to what uh, Dorothy and Nancy was saying, was uh, we all remembered uh, Canada Day. That was one of the biggest crowds that we've ever had out, and things that were going on for for kids, uh, uh, things that were going on for for everybody, and. Uh, and that's one time that the whole community got together. I mean, for years and years, we kept it in the north end of the town. This year, we took it to the south end, and we were scared we were going to lose people. We gained. We gained more people. And it turned out to be one of the best Canada days that we ever had. And it was thanks to our, our staff and, and everybody that lived in New Tecumseh. Thank you. It was a BIA, yes, that came through for us and the legions and all the other nonprofits. I don't know if we're getting off uh, topic here, Nancy or Dorothy, <laughs> but uh hey, lots of things that we need to do and <laughs> well, sort of jump ahead. So <laughs> yeah. So we're just gonna do uh go over the or the last one is economic diversification. So I guess the question is we're doing looking at the the four uh themes. They're very general, but I think they're like I said very specific to your area as well. So um, ground rules is we're, we're trying to get some input from you looking. So we, we're going to go over the four questions. We've got, we've got about 15 minutes per theme. So what we're looking for from you is that um, is first of all, for healthy community commercial districts, thinking about what kind of actions can be done to help the business, the, those three commercial commercial districts to be sort of healthy. And I think what we're going to do is that instead of writing them up on a larger sheet of paper, Dorothy and I are just going to take notes while we're sitting here, um, because then we're still on on Zoom. Uh, so if we can, so it's like, so think about sort of what actions, and we've already talked about some of these, some of them have already come up, but sort of what actions uh, could be undertaken to better coordinate the three commercial districts. Um, we talked a little bit about that. Examples, planning for joint events, that sort of thing. Uh, the second one, the second question, maybe what specific actions need to be implemented to improve or upgrade or revitalize these the infrastructure in these commercial districts. So thinking about that, what types of businesses are missing um, in one or the other or all three of them? 
uh, what can be done to attract these types of businesses. And the other one is thinking about what's current, what is currently the biggest competition for the retail and rest retail and restaurants in the commercial district. What are, you know, where are people going to eat? Are they eating locally or are they going to bury or are they going somewhere else? And it go, comes back to that sort of leakage. Um, so what are the biggest competition and how can, what can you do to help those small businesses, the retailers and the restaurants? So and Nancy spoke about the, the huge growth that's expected here. And you're already seeing in the, in the housing that's, that's popping up in, in all of the, um, the three main commercial districts. Um, it, it, and with that residential growth that's coming forward and you're seeing now, there is a huge opportunity to really revitalize the commercial districts. But the thing is we need to, we need to undertake actions that get community thinking about going to those districts and shopping and dining there. And, and, and the growth that's happening will bring the people in, but the people want to see the type of retail that's there. It's a bit of a catch 22 because retail is not going to come. Restaurants aren't going to come until they see the demographics. And then you'll start seeing when they start seeing the numbers growing in this community, the retail is going to start coming in. And to Nancy's point about investment readiness, do you have those retail locations available? When they start wanting to come in here and, and find a location, do you have that commercial or are you um, converting development properties that come up, commercial properties that come up? Are they getting converted to residential themselves? So maintaining that commercial uh, high street is really important. Um, what are things that can be done to make sure that these areas remain healthy and continue to um, continue to be healthy? All right, Nancy, since we're odd numbers, do you want three teams of threes or or how did you want no, to do No, we're all going to stay in the same, we're all going, oh, to, we're all going to work there and then we're going to go over each theme for 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, so everybody can participate. Okay. So you don't have to move. Them. Thank you. Maybe we could just start with the, you know, what do you see as the biggest competition for your commercial districts? Someone mentioned the district themselves that they're that they believe that they're that they're competition for each other but are people going elsewhere okay go to uh Councilor harris mcclair and then Councilor foster um i i'm not going to answer that specific question because i don't know because my the people i know do eat locally um if they go out to eat at all but um what i was thinking about is when you asked about do we have commercial space available and I know that there is some, um, however, um, I know it's a major complaint for, for a lot of the downtown, like the BIAs, is that there's a lot of service um, available on the main street. And I'm guilty of that. My Where I work is on the main street and it's taking up one of those um, spots that could be um, used for, you know, something like retail or commercial, or, yes, more commercial. So a lot of, there is a lot of service on the main street, especially in Alliston. Um, actually, I, I don't I don't even know that as a fact. I think for all three towns, it probably is. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. So having some other spots for people to move to, you know, if there was plazas where there could be a tax accountant, for example, or real estate agents, um, that would be, I guess, an option, but we don't have those kind of other spots for them to move to. Thank you. Mr. Foster. Thank you, Mayor Mellon. I think you've, there's a lot of questions in what you said there. So let me address a couple of them. One is one of the biggest challenges is we're a large commuter town as noted in. And so if you go to out highway 88, you go to Bradford and in Bradford, as you come across from the downtown of Bradford, you can shop, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Canton, you can go to Home Depot, you can do everything on your drive home as compared to getting here, depending on where you live in Beaton, Tottenham and Alliston, if you went. So all surrounding us all, Barrie, um, Innisfil, Bradford, Orangeville, you know, further down south to Brampton, you have major stops along the way 
that will basically satisfy every consumer's needs all the way. So I think for people that are commuters, there's a huge incentive because time is of the essence. They're trying to get home to get you know their, their kids and families and everything else. So they do one-stop shopping. And we don't offer that in New Tecumseh. We offer a, a much different experience. Some would argue better. I, I would argue better. But so I think that's a huge problem for the commuting public. I think for the people that, that live here um, in the South, Beaton and Tottenham, Orangeville and Bradford are extremely close. So you make that drive back to Alliston, 15 minutes, and depending on what you were looking for, you may have something in those other two towns. So I think there's sort of a dividing line that might say, okay, we're going to go south. I think in Alliston, we're a bit lucky that we have more of the major um, retail here. So I don't think it's as, as prominent, but I'll let some of my friends in, in, the, in the South speak to what people's habits are. In terms of, of the businesses that are here, um, I think we have, we have wonderful businesses. It's just, how do we get more of them? And I think a lot of that just comes through communication and marketing. Like I've, you know, I'm sure most of us, you go into a restaurant somewhere else in a different town if you're traveling and you say, you know, this is a great restaurant. You ever thought about Alliston? Alliston, where's Alliston? And then you tell them and you talk about the numbers and, and Honda and, and I've had some people come here and, and look and think, ah, oh, they weren't interested. But so I think that's one of our big challenges is just, is just the message that there are great spots. Beat and Tottenham and Alliston are fantastic spots. You know, some of our best restaurants are in the South here. No disrespect to anything up here, but Taste of Freedom is fantastic. The Whistle Stop, you know, unfortunately it's gone. Mr. Gigi's, you can name all kinds, not to pick out any. So I think we do have a, a lot of wonderful things. It's just, we need to expand more of it. Okay. I think you raised like the most important word when you said experience and um, commercial districts everywhere are facing challenges from big box and all, all of those challenges, but also online shopping. So retail is retail is having a real challenge right now. And um, what a lot of small communities are doing, large and small communities are doing, are creating more of an experience, a reason to shop here, even though it's not as efficient, you know, for the commuter traffic. But they have more frequent small community events that make it an experience to come to your commercial district. And then the shopping follows from that. Um, and I think the other thing that's been helpful for businesses is having some digital main street staff go in and help the businesses that are there sell online. Again, that creates more of a market for them to come do the marketing and un help them understand because many of them don't know how to do social, uh, the so use the social media to help build their, the existing businesses that they have here. Anybody else? Uh, okay, I'll come through Jack. Thank you. Um, just the question, what is currently the biggest competition for retail and restaurants in the commercial districts? Um, comment that was given to me is that having a bigger selection for clothing retail. So they're going out because we have very limited clothing stores for a particular age group or for a particular, um, uh, uh, I won't go any further. Uh, but when they do go out of town, then they're, they're going to those restaurants. Like I was thinking at the South end of Barrie, so there's uh, many different shops there and then there's different restaurants and, and didn't get their tires changed and oil changed and everything else. So those, it's the, the clothing retail, they, they would like to see more of a selection. Well, I, I was sitting with a group of people last week, last Tuesday afternoon for a luncheon, and there would be about 30 of us sitting around the table and not one of the 30 knew about the bus service that we have here that goes from Allison to Beaton uh, to the Go Train in, in Bradford. And and these people live here and they said, we didn't know anything about it. So there's a problem that that I have is that we've, we've got to educate the public that we, we have a trans, transportation service here, runs every hour on the hour, all day. And it's uh, it's a pilot project and it's done by the county but we're part of the county, we should be promoted more. And uh, what's going to happen is we're going to lose it. 
and uh, unfortunately it doesn't go to Tottenham, but we're working on that. Uh, the future council will be working on that. But uh, there's a transfer station. We've had, uh, uh, Blaine, how many, six months? We, yeah, a year. And uh, and these are these are all senior people. I said, oh, if we had known that, we would definitely use it. We would go downtown or because it goes right to Union Station. And for those that are over 65, you can do it for eight bucks and free parking. So, <laughs> so. so maybe there's opportunities too between the two communities to be like going back to, you know, how do you join them to better coordinate? So maybe there's activities that can be done in one community and the other community getting people back and forth. So you, you promote that. So things are happening in both places and getting people on the bus. So it helps to, to uh, increase the number of people taking the bus, but also building that sort of strength between the two communities. Yeah. And Deputy Mayor and Councillor Foster. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. And no, thanks for those comments because the mayor and I did work very hard. They were actually <clears throat> just going to go across 89. Your Worship, remember that with the bus? And we're like, we got them as far into our municipality as we can. And trust me, we haven't stopped doing it, but pushing for it. But from all the comments I hear, once again, I think the common theme, and I know I've said this two or three times, is that it stretches back to the municipality taking the lead, taking the charge and plowing through and making sure that we include our business partners and our downtown commercial cores with us when we start building these new relationships and I, and I think we need to communicate a lot better we have the town itself we have committees we have bias we have other groups and i just think collectively as long as we can start building those those bridges get rid of those gaps and start with the communication process so i know act dev as councillor foster said walking on the street and the mayor has already said she's doing it I, I think that's fantastic so maybe we need to include our communications department too and start ramping up how we're going to communicate and share the messages and of course ask them to participate back thanks worship thank you Pastor foster thank you very much i think there's something else you, you talked about experience i think there's another word that um is important in destination because if if you look like for example in this town the Tottenham Bluegrass Festival being one of them, the Potato Festival, those are dates that people put on their calendars year after year after year. There are people that only come to this town at Potato Festival. There are only people that come to this town in, for Tottenham Bluegrass. They're huge events. They're well-respected. They're well-known for hundreds of miles around. So I think it's important and, you know, to address what Councillor Beatty said about the BIAs and the chambers. They're the driving force behind some of these events. So I think towns like this need to be, you know, you could name all kinds Pumpkin Fest over in Port Elgin. I mean, there are people that drive there. They have the largest antique car, three, 400 cars in October. And you talk to people that are there, it's a destination and there's all kinds of them. So I think we have an opportunity here to create more destinations throughout the summer and winter months that really attract people. And, and you know, if they're putting it on their calendar to go to New Tecumseh within a certain month, that's a pretty spectacular thing, right? Um, Councillor Lacey. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was actually just uh, about to talk about the same thing as, as Councillor Foster. We have a lot of great um, areas within within New Tecumseh. I mean, we've got the South Simcoe Railway. We got the conservation. We should be promoting those and bringing bringing money inside from outside of New Tecumseh. So you know, it, it's it's talk about that barrel. You know, instead of filling up the barrel with with money from inside, filling it up for money with outside preventing that leakage um, from people going outside. We, we'd be far better um, bringing that up to here um, and promoting a lot of the local aspects of what we've got, so. Thank you, good comment. Councillor Max there. Thank you. Speaking of um, districts, I went down to Niagara-on-the-Lake um, about you know three weeks ago. You could not move on the sidewalk. It was so full. It was outstanding. I mean, those businesses are hopping. There's, you know, there's not one empty storefront. Every store was busy, retail, restaurants, everything. So um, they were the first heritage district created in Ontario. And right now we're, we have the opportunity to create a heritage district in Beaton. And I'm telling you, just wait. You know, it it will become a destination. It already is for filming, but if we take that step and create that heritage district, it will come. It will start to attract people and it will start to bring in businesses. And then 
hopefully we'll have the same situation where all of downtown Beaton will be bustling. Thank you. Councilor uh, Sainsbury. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, a lot of places that are really popular are not on urban services, like Milan Loretta's in St. Hampton. Great dining spot. Special menu tells the history and story of Myler and Loretta going down on the ship <laughs> on her way there. And uh, the same with Creemore. It's a very short distance for numbers of shops. It's very old fashioned. And that's what you're talking about in Beaton. People go to the Globe. It's on a well and septic. People go to Mrs. Mitchell's and Granny taught us how in uh, Violet Hill. And it's on a well and septic. So because of our rules, everybody feels they have to be in the urban service area. But as long as they have sufficient land and they can put in a proper septic system with a tank even that is pumped, it can be managed from an environmental standpoint. And that's becomes a destination. Because senior citizens, and we have tons of them who want to dine out, they used to love the bistro, but it's gone. So now they go to, whoops, to the Globe or to Milan Loretta's, or they go further afield. They've reopened what used to be called the Quaint House on Highway 88, going from um, far ahead. Ahead, back into to Bradford. And so they're destinations, and I think they're important too. So if you can find an old-fashioned house and they can address all the environmental issues and they have parking and they have fire protection, they have whatever they require, then it could be successful for destination when they do come to the train or they come to the conservation. Then they have an, another place to go. Taste of Freedom is very popular. So if, if we could look at things that are on our periphery and not necessarily in the downtown, seniors are not really getting too excited about franchise type restaurants because they're hectic, they're noisy. Uh, it's kind of just thrown at you. They don't have that quality of sitting down and dining and chatting in a quiet atmosphere. Yeah, but we certainly have a ready-made market with all the seniors that we have and that we're luring to our town. Good, thank you. Uh, Dorothy? And there's so much to offer here. And I think from the idea, the idea of bringing people in to experience, you know, the destination and what's here, it's really about communicating what you've got. And, you know, years ago, the tour operators in Niagara were saying, it's so busy down here. We need other places to go, but we need a day trip. So put a package together for us and we'll be in your community. So you may not want busloads of people, but it's the idea that um, communicating what you have is is an important element of getting those people here. Good point. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And, and that's a good point. So you bring in all kinds of bustling people and busloads, but when they get to their destination, if there's nothing for them to do, they're not going to come back and they're not going to recommend it. They're not going to come just to want and walk down a street and take a look around going. So, I mean, the onus is you, you got to make sure there, there is activities and places like Councillor Lacey said, a conservation area, steam train, uh, uh, festivals, all that type of stuff. So you're right. If you bring them, you got to make sure that you, once you get them here, there's lots of entertainment or stuff for them to see to do. Is that a fair statement? Thank yes. you. Build it and they will come. It's, it's, can we just, um, I'm just thinking, looking at time and we want to go through all the four, all four of the themes to get your input. So um, I guess if you have, when we're going through these things, if you have other things that you want to add that you haven't been able to um, talk about, then you can send me or Dorothy an email about it and we can add those in too. I just don't want to, I don't want to uh, not be able to get to the fourth one. Thanks, Nancy. Okay. Don't forget you're dealing with politicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An election year. <laughs> so the next one is about investment readiness. So thinking about, we talked about, you know, what sort of places do you have places uh, to locate any businesses as they come in? Is there buildings, land? Um, we talked about the uh, process and uh, and whether you're open, how you could be open and welcoming for investment in business. So are there, are, do you have any sort of thoughts, I'm sure you do, thoughts on that as to what, how to make it more business friendly, how to have more space available for business? And it's, and it's two different, two different areas. I mean, there's, there's retail, you know, in your commercial district, but then there's the other types of business. So your commercial in offices, probably not going to get, but manufacturing, 
agriculture. Um, do you have shovel ready land? That's what we hear most from site selectors. Um, because if, if you're two years away or three years away from having the property zoned and having services to the property line, they're gonna skip right over you. Um, we understand from Becky, there's lots of interest in businesses coming here. Um, I mean, you, you could probably fill all the employment land that you have, but it's making sure that it's, it's ready. So do you feel that your employment land is ready is shovel ready is zoned properly to bring in the businesses that are interested in being here okay. customer foster um, thank you for that I'm, I'm gonna put that question back to mr abbotts is that just because i don't i don't know the answer so i'd like to the industrial lands here in the 14th let's use those define shovel ready so someone coming here today and said i want to get on that land and i want to build a factory, a, a tier two, a tier three supplier to Honda. Would would we consider those lands shovel ready? And if we don't consider the, them shovel ready, is there something that this municipality or this council can do to move that closer to shovel ready? And from the time of initial contact with the town, are they at the one to two year mark? And what do we need to do to get them down to a three to six month mark? Sure. Uh, through your worship to Council Foster, um, so in terms of shovel ready, uh, I guess in, in that definition, I know there are services available down industrial parkway for those industrial lands. They're all zoned, they're all designated for that type of development, but just like any other property that's along industrial parkway, it would be required to enter into any site plan agreement, development agreement, um, but any of the, the uses that are contemplated in the zoning bylaw or official plan are ready. Uh, but there's still works required from a developer. Um, you know, if you wanted to look at the town making them more shovel ready, that would be the town acquiring those lands and doing internal servicing works and maybe blocking out an industrial plan of subdivision and having blocks available for development. But that's a significant investment that may or may not pan out um, for this municipality. But from a a town's perspective, they are ready. It's just, we need businesses to come to that area and, and want to develop on those lands. And for as long as I've worked here, if they've been in that situation, it's just, they've sat as farmer's fields for for as long as I can remember. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Councillor Beattie. Thanks, Your Worship. I was in Niagara on the Lake last week for Justin's birthday, and I can confirm that uh, on Monday at 1130 in the morning, it looks like Potato Festival weekend in Niagara on the Lake. It's it's bustling constantly, despite the weather, despite the calendar. Um, one of the things that one of the very limited tools that we have as a council to help businesses directly is the CIP grant. And I know that staff work tremendously hard on revamping and modernizing the CIP grant so that more people have more ways to maximize the use of those dollars. Um, the problem, and a lot of everybody will be familiar with some of the economic development conversations throughout the pandemic, um, we're limited in how we can directly help businesses without bonusing, which is not allowed. Um, so one of the things that I think it was Bradford West Gwillenbury that did, they established, they established a program despite it being bonusing. And I remember having some conversations with some business owners and other people on all sides of the argument. Um, and I certainly heard all sides, but um, from a practicality standpoint, if we just said, okay, we're going to throw 1% at it, $250,000, just to put a number on it. So $250,000 this year to help our business community. Okay, 5,000 divided by 50 or 5,000 times 50 is $250,000. So which 50 out of the hundreds get it? And that's the pro that's sort of where it lands in checkmate. So my question is how do we, how, how can we incentivize and inspire and entice businesses um, and support them financially besides a CIP grant and going around the bonusing piece. I feel like we, I feel like as a local council, the closest connection to these businesses 
we have to be able to do more than help them with a sign or some, uh, you know, a, a decent front on their store. There has to be more. Thank you, uh, Commissioner B. And Nancy or Dorothy want to respond? Uh, go, go ahead. Well, I, so you're speaking specifically more about the downtown sort of the retail environment. Um, I, I think it, it you get into kind of a dangerous game of trying to just offer financial incentives, and and that's the reason why the province put in that bonusing legislation is to put everyone on that even playing field. Um, so, but I think there's there's other ways you can support those businesses. I think you have patio program here where you um, waive fees for permits. Um, maybe you've expedited the, the pro process to allow those. You're letting them use parking spaces on the road. So patio program is a good thing. Um, um, sometimes in, in communities, it's, it's about parking. Um, we hear from many communities that, um, you know, People have to pay for parking, and and so, or they're limited in the time frame, and they're not going to go to restaurants because they're going to run out of their parking time. So parking something. So there's different holding small events and supporting the BIAs and doing events to bring people out, um, helping with the marketing. So there's ways that you can help the community without giving them money specifically. But so, some some places do facade grants. Um, and I'm not sure what was in your CIP specifically, um, but facade grants are are good. I think the most successful thing I've seen recently um, in communities is the digital Main Street program. And I can't tell you um, just how excited businesses are to have someone come into their business and say, I'm here to help you. It's free. I can help you whatever you need. You want to put your business online. I heard of a bakery that said, I've been trying to put my business online for five years. Um, I had a digital Main Street person who came in here and helped me do it in a week. And it put me, it allowed me to survive through COVID. So it's, this is the, like that in, the, in, in retail, don't have time to read about it, to take courses on it. If they can have someone come in and they're their dedicated person to help them with it, that program is so effective um, and, and seeing it all across the province. Um, and I think it's expanding across Canada now. Um, it, the, the, the help is that there's a trusted person they can call to, to get them to another level in their business plan. Great, great. Custer Foster. Thank you, Mel. To address your second point about what do the town of New Tecumseh staff and elected officials need to do or continue doing, it, it you started out, Nancy, and you made a comment about the old philosophy is, uh, of chasing smokestacks. And yet it, it, it seems as if we keep coming back to the communication and reaching out, which those, those two comments seem at odds with each other because in essence, what I think that, 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 that we could do and a number of times have been mentioned is the reaching out to, the, to Mayor Mill's point is that they've already been out. Now that's not chasing a smokestack, but in terms of businesses, you maybe have to chase smokestacks. Is that is that so? Am I misunderstanding what you said with chasing smokestacks? Because I guess that's yeah. my question, Nancy. Um, if I, could. I think it's part. There is the attraction part. So yeah. yes, you're always going to be. You want to attract the business into yeah. the community. It's the chasing smokestacks is more the industrial sort of side of things. You know those big, you know, big industrial businesses that have been that we used to try to attract into communities um but you're always going to want to attract a business of course you need that good supplementary so then to, to the point about the second thing i think it's the communication with small business it's 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 the it's the continuation of becky making herself known to people that she's a wonderful resource she gets things done and and if you have issues, she's almost a bit of a liaison in some cases. So I think that's what you're speaking to, is it not? Yes. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Harris, back there. Thank you. So going to the first question, are there places for businesses to locate land in our buildings? Um, so it seems to me like from what I know is that there is some land. There's a there is a big swath in the near Honda of industrial land that's available 
Um, you know, we've had people come forward. There is an MZO that wanted to turn some other property, some farmland into a uh, industrial property. And we said, you don't need to because there's already existing industrial land that's available, go there. And so, um, so I think that there is industrial land. However, there's other, um, there's, there aren't buildings. There used to be a lot of um, vacant buildings when I had my business most of the buildings were were vacant in downtown Tottenham. And now it's not so much like that, which is fantastic. Um, you know, so what we're looking at is doing, there. there is, we need to think about that because again, to my point, the exact same thing I said, there's a lot of services on the main streets um, because there isn't anywhere else for them to go. So. I'm Thank you. I'll go. Councillor Jeb and the CIO. Thank you, Your Worship. I was just thinking, is there, um, in the planning and the engineering, is there ways that they could, I know they try to streamline, but is there, can they identify things that could maybe be, be um, further streamlined, like to make it easier to attract those businesses, small businesses to come? I'm just putting it out there that maybe there's another way that can, you know, another opportunity to streamline. Okay, Dorothy. Um, stream, streamlining process is, is good, but uh, sometimes um, information is helpful. So some DIAs or the town um, could put together um, a toolkit of sort that really is a gap analysis to say in Beaton or in Elliston or <laughs> in our commercial district, this is the kind of businesses we have. This is our projected demographics and where we're growing we're missing a bakery or we're missing this we kind of store. This is what we want to get. And then you can use that as a nice tool to go out to help with that attraction. And the BIAs can use it as well. And the commercial or the, the retail um, realtors who are out there have that information readily available. It helps in decision-making processes because you're saying, look, look at us and this is what we want to see here. This is what our community wants. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, Blaine. Mr. CAO. Okay, thank you, Mayor Mellon. Uh, a, a couple of comments on, on some of the, the recent discussion. Um, can we streamline processes always? Um, over the past number of years, we've done a fair bit of process mapping to understand just the steps it takes to, to produce something. Um, in our planning and engineering areas, uh, the subdivision um, approval process was one that we looked at. Um, one of the things that we found, and I think it gets back to a comment that uh, Deputy Mayor Norcross made on the communications front, is sometimes when we look at the information that our staff has provided to review, it doesn't meet anything of a requirement that we need. So sometimes the submissions are the problem and that's what slows down the process when i see uh, emails go out saying that well this the sixth submission of a site plan yeah site plan should not take six submissions yeah they just plain shouldn't so you know again being frank um either we have a problem on our side reviewing it or someone has a problem in understanding what we're saying because they're not submitting what they should be we can't obviously change the quality. And quite frankly, I'm not about to start doing someone else's work for them. They pay a consultant probably fairly good money to do that work for them. But we can make it very simple for them to understand or at least communicate to them what is required. So we, we have made steps to do just that so that people have a very clear understanding as to what's required. Um, another comment with respect to shovel ready land. Um, yes, we have an abundance of shovel ready land, depending on how you define shovel ready, but we have an abundance of shovel ready land. Problem is there's no water to service it. Very little. So every business that knocks on our door over the past couple of years, we have to ask them, what exactly are you looking to do there? Because if you have a factory with robotics, you may not need a lot of water. 
if you have a factory that you're going to put 200 people in, 200 people drink water, flush toilets, do things, you need more water. So we have allocated water to industrial development, but there's not an excessive amount. It's just not there. So the land might be ready, but it's not service ready. Councilor Harrison McIntyre. So when you were just saying that, it made me think of um, something I was listening to about Salt Lake City and um, there, the Salt Lake City Lake is drying up and 60% of the water that's um, being diverted is for industrial use. So I, I, it just made me think, is there any savings of water that can be done at the town level um, that we can, I mean, we've talked about this environmental groups um, that perhaps what we need to look at is town-wide starting to be more conservative about how we use water. Um, and that would be helpful for many reasons on many levels. Leaving that aside, um, there is a property that that is currently being developed for um, industrial use. They went through the zoning, they did everything. I happen to have been speaking to somebody who um, is, an, is somewhat related to that. And she works for another town. And she said that our process was, there was a lot of problems with it. I can get more details on that, but she said there was a lot of things that were asked for that the town that she works for aren't asked for. And frankly, she thought that they were unnecessary. So if you want more detailed feedback, because again, we're looking at trying to create a system that works for um, attracting industry, I could ask to get some more of those details and pass them on. CAO, through you, Mayor Milne, I would welcome any comments that you've received. Councillor Harris McIntyre, um, I, I always take what I hear with other municipalities you know, with a little bit of salt, um, but it's obviously, it's something that I would more than welcome. Um, but I do recognize that some municipalities work differently, some perhaps better, some perhaps worse, some perhaps I wouldn't recommend that we follow, but um, any commentary I would be more than happy to, uh, to read through. With respect to your first comments, um, all kinds of work with respect to water conservation, absolutely. A uh, number of municipalities that um, have water challenges uh, from a, 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 an ongoing basis have looked into and explored and implemented uh, gray water systems. Not everything in life needs potable water to be addressed. So some manufacturing does that themselves because obviously when you have a very large manufacturing system, you don't want to be paying a water rate. So uh, on every drop of water you use for cooling or things like that in manufacturing. So they look at recycling their own water. Um, but yes, some municipalities have gone down the path of gray water systems, essentially a third water type of system other than it's not potable water and it's obviously not wastewater that's going to be treated, but um, it's recycled gray water, which can be looked at. Um, that's a very, very timely and, and expensive process to start to get into, but some people obviously feel that in the long run, the investment is worth it. Thank you, good comments. Nancy, how are we doing? We are, well, we're, we don't have a lot of time left. So um, we're thinking that to, we talked about, we've talked about business retention and expansion of quite a bit through, you know, shopping local and, you know, helping businesses out. So we're thinking that unless somebody has another comment or another uh, action that they feel needs to be addressed to get, um, to keep business here, I think we need to just jump ahead and go, <laughs> and go to, business or economic diversification because that's a bit different than um what we've already been talking about I mean, we really dealt with that so is everyone okay with that go ahead <laughs> okay so talking about economic diversification and we know that you you're fairly heavy on the side of uh automotive so and that came up which is good and you know but you do need that sort of diversification as well around the economy so thinking about uh does the town have the right infrastructure zoning to support economic diversification and what if anything is needed the second question to think about are are there any specific types of industries or businesses that should be attracted 
or expand it uh, and that maybe you should be targeting? Um, and what sort of distinguishes new Tecumseh from other communities and what could be done? And this may not just be industrial or, you know, it could be commercial, it could be film, it could be around uh, a variety of different, something different that you think needs to be attracted to this area. Yeah. 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 Bring back the potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and it's a joke, but it's true. I mean, processing of our agricultural products you know it, it it's not always done it's not done here uh, we have a it used to be from what I hear from Councillor Jeb um, but uh, certainly everyone learned about um, eating locally and I mean having all having food that is produced locally and and so another reason why it's really important that we support our agricultural community is because mm -hmm. now is uh, it's really obvious that we need to be self-sufficient. Um, but I would, I, I, there's a lot of manufacturing this in this area. There's not a lot of research and development. There's not, you know, engineering companies or, um, or that sort of thing. And it would be fantastic if those people who are, I don't know if there's a term for it, didn't have to leave here. I mean, there's no university here, obviously there's no post-secondary education here um that would be fantastic too um but you know anybody who goes and gets an education at a university really they're only as far as I can really tell there's a couple jobs that they can get at Baxter a couple jobs they can get at Honda but other than that you know people are commuting okay comes from McClellan Thank you, Worship. One thing I always, um, I play a lot of baseball. I play a lot up at the Barry Sports Complex, which is a huge, huge baseball complex. Um, and something that is sort of a little bit different than, than the regular retail and commercial that we talk about is, but they have these pinwheels and every weekend that I go there, they have ladies tournaments, men's tournaments, mixed tournaments. They have some, um, obviously not professional ball, but the Barry Bay Cats play there. And just the amount of people that go into this into this complex is, is huge. And then when you leave at the end of the day, you stop by because you're just on the outskirts of Barry and you do some shopping. So it, it's one of those things that sort of draws people into town. And I think. Um, I think sports is something that that we tend to leave out when it comes to economics, but it can play a, big, a really big role in it if done properly. Good. Thank you. Councillor uh, Foster, please. NPD and then Thank you, Mayor Milne. When you asked the question about um, are there any specific types of industries, businesses, do you think, or is there something in your experience or travels that you would notice because based on the initial comments you made, 70 to 80% of businesses are gonna expand or know, some, or, or know somebody else. So that would suggest to you that most of our expansion will probably occur in the automotive sector, being tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers to Honda. Mm -hmm. But in your experience, is there anything glaring that's missing, that we're missing as a council or we're missing as, as a municipality? Dorothy, <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you're you're bang on with uh, your comment about the supply chain for automotive. I mean, that's that's kind of a, an obvious choice for for looking at, at, at bringing in new business. Um, we heard through the consultations and through Becky about the, the film industry and um, its success in Beaton. Um, that that's such a great opportunity. Um, you've got some really nice assets here and we toured the building where we're having the consultation tomorrow Gibson's, Gibson Center Gibson Center I if that were out in any kind of um, film industry that would be a perfect location the museum that's here um, the streetscape that's here the whole community is is kind of a burgeoning opportunity for film and um, I, I think that that's, that's, that's one that you could definitely pursue. You could be proactive about it, or you could simply test the market by looking at what is coming in and, and just keeping track of it for the next year and saying, what kind of interest are we getting? What, what are we turning away? 
what are what's what film are we getting in and what kind of revenue and what's the opportunity for the town the most money that you make if you're looking at bringing revenue in is if you're using town facilities and you're renting those out because the film industry will pay a lot of money for those um, but that aside, the town can support the film industry with the issuance of permits for road closures, for the use of parks and other facilities. Um, and so it could work with Nottawasaga and, and who I understand is, is doing a lot of the, or addressing a lot of film inquiries now. Definitely an opportunity for the town. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I'm a fifth generation farmer, so I'm about 30% potato chip <laughs> at this stage in my life. Um, but uh, when I was a kid 30, 40 years ago, that street just outside this building, uh, that it would bustle till nine o'clock at night, not just on Friday night, on Thursday night. Baffles Justin that the stores were open till nine on Thursdays, much less Friday, but it was different back then. Um, how do you, with the pandemic having having gone through that, I know that we all want to, to, we know that there's a lot of service type businesses downtown. They occupy predominantly a lot of space. I know that when we think about bringing businesses to town, I know a lot of us probably think about the mom and pa shops and the restaurants and the little shops that we all like to be in, in places like Niagara on the Lake and stuff. But um, what if those people just aren't there? What if those businesses just aren't there to open? And I think that's how you end up with a service-based businesses in the downtown or your 14th nail salon or your 13th pizza parlor and, and so on and so forth. Like you can incentivize and, 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 and entice these businesses all you want, but if there's nobody to open them and, and be in the stores. So I think, and I, this is my question. Um, I think our opportunity is to help people or incentivize people to get into the business world the next best way, which is operating their businesses or launching their business out of their homes without going into a commercial location and assuming all of the risk and the financial liabilities to hopefully get your product or your service off the ground. A lot of businesses could probably launch much more effectively if they start at home. I think of a photographer that is very successful and has been over the years. And uh, he's had a, a number of locations. He had a location on uh, Victoria Street in the plaza, served its purpose for many years, but now operates out of a house in, in on King Street in the ward I represent. And it, so that's a prime example of a business pivoting into a different environment and probably thriving and flourishing because the home provides more for a photographer in terms of settings and setup than the actual retail location. So is it fair to say that there's probably a huge opportunity for us rather than try and get people to fill buildings, to get people confident in their ability to, to launch their business? Because if they launch their business successfully and effectively, mission accomplished, and they get to the next best thing, which is on our main street. Thank you. Dorothy. Um, so I, I would say it, it's it's really important to help support those home-based businesses. Um, and what I've heard from a lot of them is that you reach a stage at which you actually need a, a, a presence, a physical presence, not always. Um, and certainly in the environment we're in, a lot can do it from home for a long, long time. Um, but the growth of the, the, the co-op working spaces um, is unprecedented and, and, and really, um, I think was advanced a lot through COVID. Uh, I've seen communities go from one co-working space up to like 10 in, in you know, a, a, a population of a hundred thousand yeah, because people needed, they wanted the synergy of working with others. They wanted a professional address. Um, they wanted a place where they could meet customers that looked professional and wasn't their kitchen table. So some of the so home-based businesses is, is, is a good thing to support, but you, it would be nice to explore some of that co-working space. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of businesses who will set up those kinds of um, workspaces and maybe need to explore here. And I'm wondering too, but when it goes, when you were talking about 
getting um, engineers or you know professionals in, that that's a great space for professionals to start a business as well. Good. Uh, Councilor Vida, I think your house, the nail is also getting run by the pop shots. There's lots of that start helping up. Councilor Noy. Thank you, Your Worship. I do a lot of travel in rural Ontario and uh, I go through little towns and I noticed the, the character, the lay of it, the town. And, and uh, I'm going to give you a couple examples. Like uh, you go to Drayton, Ontario, which is in the middle of no place. And they have a, a theater. And you drive by and there's a busload of seniors who are attending that theater, which we could do over here at Gibson. We got the ideal spot, but we have to attract them people. And if you go down to another example is the Alora Gorge. It's beautiful down mm. through there. Yeah. And they've got all the restaurants sitting out there, people are sitting out and stuff like that. So my question is, how do they attract these people? Then if you keep on going down towards St. Mary's and all that area, like it's just beautiful. And they're in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden you see a busload of seniors. <laughs> they want to get out for lunch we're, or dinner, whatever the case may be. We're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just curious how, how uh, we could attract those people to like say a busload of seniors or anybody to attend a theater at uh, the Gibson Center, then go for lunch within one of our local restaurants. You know, so uh, I think the restaurants themselves would have to work with the Gibson Center, and uh, you know, communication is a big part. I think so. My comment. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, very good, Wayne. And we we do drive down through some of those little, and all of a sudden you come across them. And, uh, uh, Dorothy, did you want, or uh, Nancy, did you want to respond? Uh, I was in the Laura last week, and, and I absolutely understand what you're talking about. It's it's beautiful, and you do want to go there for a day, and you know you you maybe you're going to see the spa, or you're going to stay at the hotel, but you end up, or you're hiking for the day, but you end up shopping, and and then you're going to the restaurants, and you do make a day out of it. And I think that opportunity presents itself here as well. Um, I think that the town needs to look at the role of tourism and where it lies in terms of delivering that tourism function, whether it's at the county level or at the local level. Um, you've got the, uh, an RTO that's supporting tourism in this area. So there's lots of different players in tourism and it's where you want to spend your resources. Um, there, there are um, tour operator conventions that you can go to and you say, I've got the package for you. You bring the bus loads here and you lay it out for them. And that's what they're looking for. They are looking for that kind of information and new places to bring people. So it's out there. It's whether or not that's a priority for going out to get people. The other thing is that you've got this big population growth here and you've got to have a lot of friends and family visiting your residents who are coming here. So you're they're bringing people. It's making sure that they know about the things to do. And it kind of grows organically when people start talking about new Tecumseh, oh, and look at the main street or look what I did. And that grows. The railway trail that you have here, it's you know, coming up from Halton Hills to Caledon and, and into Tottenham, that's attracting people. And you've got um, people who are marketing that trailway you don't even know about and they're marketing your communities for you so there's lots of different players in tourism it's just connecting with them and seeing who's doing what thank you Dorothy. kind of supplementary Wait. supplementary and i forgot one little town also it's uh just north of woodbridge and uh Kleinberg. 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 you take Kleinberg for example there you go through there on a saturday night or whatever and the town is decorated beautiful. They got Canada flags up on every post, like the American way. You can start to say it, but that's the way it is. And the restaurants are full. There's no parking on the street or whatever the case may be. And they see people walking around, whether it be a nice green cone or whatever. So maybe we could look at doing that in our towns here, you know, just to dress it up 
make it presentable, more presentable, and get attractive people. So, yes. good point. Good. Thank you, Councilor Harris and McIntyre. And we're going to be calling it quits soon. So, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so, just going back onto this tourism, I think that there's a lot of things here for people to see. Um, there's the rail trail, as you mentioned, the steam train in Tottenham. Tottenham is a conservation area that has a natural amphitheater. I think it would be fantastic if we had a permanent stage there. It could attract musical um, performances. And, you know, we could look at other areas that already have that and what kind of revenue they see bringing into the area. But in Alliston, we have, we have the river. And on the river is parking. And that's municipally owned parking. So quite easily, I could see that that could be changed from parking, find parking elsewhere, and that could be turned into shops that are right on the river. And that would be beautiful, right? And that's like all these other areas that you're mentioning where the the river is highlighted and it's an attraction. And right now it's ignored and it doesn't have to be that way. But it would take a lot of money, a lot of investment and a lot of planning, but some vision. And I think that council could do that. Okay. Councillor Foster, oh, Councillor Foster, and then Councillor Jeb. Uh, thank you. To, to Councillor Noy's point, it's really just a vision and a leap of faith, because that Drayton Theatre, when they when they when they built that, it was nothing. There was nothing there. I know that place very well, and so they took a leap of faith. They joined the uh, the circuit of St Jacobs and the theatre circuit, and the reality of it is, you said the Gibson Center. We've talked about it at council. It never made the strategic plan. Maybe it will in twenty three to twenty six, but. <laughs> All the people that support Drayton, St. Jacobs, and all the theaters, 80% of them come from this town. So they drive right past the Gibson Center and go, you can't get it together, we'll go somewhere else. And that's the sad reality of it all. Okay. Pastor Jeb, you've got the last. Oh, okay. Um, just through to Becky, uh, the Heritage Tour, they, I think at Simcoe County, they had a map of all the old taverns. There used to be a tavern at the corner of the 13th and the Tottenham Road called the a dog leg or something it was all these different taverns and that was all the highlights and people could tour and then we've got the quilt tours the quilt barns and um that's another thing that we could maybe focus on is uh setting up these heritage tours and i just thought i think maybe were you at the county at that time when they did that tavern tour becky uh the mayor to councillor jeb uh i was not there for the tavern tours that was before me that uh tour does not exist anymore um but they have changed around so they have the barn quilt tour which is very popular they have a contest out right now so if you guys want a free t-shirt just take a selfie of yourself with the barn quilt put it on and you can get a free t-shirt <laughs> i have one i did it <laughs> i'm trying to get our barn on the list to get a barn quilt so, so. Uh, just to let everybody know also on that they are doing another round of the barn quilt so if you are interested or if you know a local constituent who is they can get on for the next wave the idea is to have every barn in the county at some point having a barn quilt on it um there are a number of different uh trails that the county does have including a, a kayaking trail a canoeing trail a bike trail Unfortunately, the kayaking and canoeing, we haven't been able to participate because of the state of the Boeing. Oh, sorry, because of the state of the Boeing, we haven't been able to participate in the kayak canoeing one. And we haven't been able to participate in the bike one due to the fact that our roads are considered too fast. So there's a couple of trails we've missed out on, but there are new ones coming online related to local food, which we're hoping to benefit on. And there are some trails coming online uh, related to alcoholic beverages, which uh, the BDs has also participating in. Good. Supplementary? Right. Also. Okay. I was going to do a supplementary, sorry about supporting agriculture some smaller businesses we used to have a, a mobile sandblaster and now he's gone i know there was issues all over the place but those are the kind of businesses that our agricultural community could have support that they're mobile that they come to the farms they do their work and they are uh, a needed business thank you councillor jeb last person to speak will become Sainsbury. 
we had a fundraiser at the community center in Greenbrier annually. It's uh, it's to do things within, to buy the tables and chairs if you need a new fridge, that sort of thing. But we provide the food and then people volunteer to help set everything up. And we sell out to the fire limit as far as the price of the tickets and so on. But we use the local people who bottle the wine, like Wine Haven and Cork and Vine. And they come and they bring different types of wine and they have the whole write up on what it is. And then you can get they give you free bottles. You can go make 30 bottles of your own wine for a certain price and that. And there's a form that you fill out and you give it to them. And then they call you up and set up a time for you to come and, and uh, make make your own wine. And it's just like down here across from the medical center, one of them. And there are other ones. But it it helps to promote their business. But a lot of people who come and buy a ticket think they're just coming to have a wine and cheese party. And then they get to know this fellow has a business in town and you can participate in it. And you can save a lot of money once you learn how to make the wine on your own with their help. It's something about seniors and wine. Oh, yes. <laughs> we live lucky. Okay, thanks, Council. I'm going to uh, put it back to Nancy and Dorothy to summarize it. Thank you very much. This has been a great discussion. You've had, provided us with great input. Um, even though we only had two hours, it's been fantastic. Tomorrow, so for next step, as we said, tomorrow we're meeting with uh, the public. So that'll be very interesting to hear what they have to say. And then we go back, complete the actions and uh, work with Blaine and, and uh, Becky on that. And uh, I I don't know exactly what the, how the process is going to go. Blaine's going to be communicating that with you. But anyway, we'll, we'll work towards that and uh, getting the draft strategy completed, have a chance to look at that. And then getting the final one done for September 12th. So we'll be back then. Good, thank you. thank you. And with that, I have a motion moved by Councilor Noel, Councilor McClellan. Uh, that report of ED 2022-03 be received and further that the presentation of Nancy Johnson and Dorothy Centaurs of McSweeney and Associate be received. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Jeb. I move that we adjourn at 4.57. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And I believe the clerk's got some food for us in the... Thank you.